We are happy to welcome you to the Beurs van Berlage and this evening's program, which looks more like a happening in the American adventures in architecture. And a special welcome to our guest speakers tonight, Frank Geary, John Walsh, and Kees Dam. There was a sudden and overwhelming run on the tickets for tonight. We have tried to accommodate everybody and even place a monitor in the foyer. But fortunately, we were able to seat all of you comfortably in this hall. My name is Anne Anna Wertheim. I am the director of the John Adams Institute and organizer of the lecture series American Literature Today and American Focus. During the past 10 years, the John Adams Institute has developed a program of lectures and discussions that can now claim to be a keynote podium for the best of American culture in Europe. Your presence, Mr. Geary and Mr. Walsh and Mr. Dom, is very meaningful to our institute. We realize how privileged we are to have a chance to meet you and hear about your work and about your ideas. By accepting our invitation, you have helped spread the news of our lecture series to an even greater audience. I would like to thank the Concertgebouw, the Stedelijk Museum and the Beurs van Berlage for their inspiration, advice and cooperation in this festival and especially in our program. And I would like to extend a very special thanks to AING Vastgoed and the United States Information Service for their financial support in making tonight's event possible. The evening will be opened with a short introduction by the Dutch architect Kees Dam. Mr. Dam will then give the floor to Frank Geary, who will give a presentation and show slides. At about a quarter to nine, John Walsh will join Mr. Geary on stage and open the conversation. Mr. Walsh will also give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. There will be microphones available throughout the hall, manned by John Adams Institute people and volunteers. At approximately 9.30, Mr. Alexander Renoy Khan, member of the board of ING, will close the evening. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Mr. Dam, may I ask you to come up the podium? Heel goed, heel goed. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be able to introduce two special people as guests here in the Amsterdam Beurs of Berlage, the beautiful building with the beautiful interiors. One of them is an eminent art historian and art expert and the director of the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, John Walsh. Frank Geary, the other guest, is an architect. He's renowned for his talent for creating buildings that, as many have already noted, defy all description. Indeed, it is difficult to find words to express the spatial quality that is typical to Frank Gehry's buildings. Nevertheless, I would like to an attempt at doing so, because good architecture, as the architect Adolf Loos said, is a architecture parlante, an architecture whose description is life. Even in his earliest work, you can see that Frank Gehry's buildings have a certain expressive plasticity that explores the sculpture of shape as well as that of space. Traditional Japanese architecture provided the inspiration for his early work, but the work of the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright was also formative. It was on this tradition that Frank Gehry based his architecture, especially because it probes the relationship between form, style and space. These are three essential aspects of architecture, 
still often overlooked thanks to the whims of building practice. Even for many architects, form, style and space are rather abstract constructs, but they do bridge the gap between architecture and visual arts. With the help of this exploration, the architect can find freedom in design, in virtuosity can thus flourish. Frank Gehry follows this road too, by understanding each building task as a study and observation, attentive observation. Frank Gehry is carried along by his sense of vision. Many experiments in shape and style are reviewed. His buildings always seem to be present a particular facial expression. There are an aesthetic affirmation. If there is a recurring theme in Frank Gehry's work, then it is this, a celebration of space and speciality by using all that architecture has to offer. He explores space as an artist would. His early designs are quite prosaic. Straightforward buildings that speak a rectangular language. Frangeri seeks purity in space, the freedom that space can occupy, whilst doing that he has developed a penchant for incompleteness. Buildings are often at their most handsome when they are still scaffolded. Light and space have free reign through the veil of the scaffold poles. It's direct space in raw materials. This incompleteness does a cut and run with the elements of architecture and it starts communicating with its own possibilities and breaks loose. At the same time, there is more scope for meaning, for using metaphors, sometimes pictorial ones, but mostly a metaphor borrowed from the métier itself, from our everyday interaction with architectonic meanings. What happens when space transcends itself? And what happens to light and material? Those are the questions Frangieri asks and what he wants to be able to recognize straight away. He designs by looking and he wants to see what he has conceived as fast as possible. Working with models is essential. The next step is to perceive the change in space, the change and the reversal of space. Space is in this final interpretation something that moves. Frangieri brings space to life. In his buildings, he has evolved into a living organism. It is if he, his design talent has started to develop truly. Truly, this is a natural architecture, the culmination of which is the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. There you have a building in which architectural form that restrains a titanium wind, wind has taken shape. A building that folds into the city and re-enacts it, however friendsight it may seem at first sight. This building has fused in a natural way with city and water. A building that also, also alludes to the city from a spatial point of view. An exhibition hall in the shape of a station concourse, reached by a hall like a cathedral. Then a tapestry of all dimensions, dimensions of space and spatial ideas. A building that defies the boundaries of what is possible in architecture with advanced computer techniques, utopian forms can take shape. In Europe, our attention is called to the candor Americans seem to have been able to make such architectonic gestures to liberally draw on any source of inspiration. That is indeed the case to a certain extent. 
in Europe, examples of the past watch over our shoulders whilst we sketch our next design. Architects over here tend to converse more with traditions and are wary of letting them go. In the Netherlands, another factor, factor enters into things, a particular kind of down-to-earthness reflected in a typical Dutch expression, act normally, that's crazy enough as it is, or something to that effect. On the face of it, not a very demanding architectonic challenge. Here in the Netherlands, we think of Frank Gehry's architecture as unique. To him, however, it is probably ordinary. But what is ordinary? Here we expect buildings to earn money, a sort of trading spirit and that sometimes also strives to quality. We don't want to deliver an inferior product, but it's quality you want, and that at the lowest possible price. In Frank Gehry's mind, however, there is a natural interaction between architecture and art. It is there to celebrate life, and that is no ordinary attitude. It suggests that visual arts are no longer an addendum to architecture and no longer a joint venture between art and architecture, which generates new meaning. It's a fusion of both disciplines because it is about form, it is about space, and it is about light. I've been to Bilbao sometimes more than, but I've, if my worries about life as a Dutch architect get too much for me, I will gladly go back there and think to myself, you see, it is possible. Thank you. Will you come to the floor? Yes. stairs here. Um, it's great to be in this wonderful building with all of you. So um, Today I had the opportunity to go to Arnhem and meet the mayor and the planner, Herr Sutter, and uh, Ben Burkle, my friend, and discuss the potential for a new project in that little little town. And it got very exciting talking to them about the possibility of a, of a collaboration where three or four architects can work together simultaneously to make, make a work. It's something I dream of doing. In, uh, John Walsh is the guy who got me to come here. And I made a deal with him that if I come, he would uh, give me a few days uh, teaching me about Dutch paintings. And so that's the payoff for this, <laughs> this uh, trip. So my wife and I will go look at Dutch paintings. Uh, many of them I've seen. I'm very anxious to hear him talk about Van de Velde and, uh, because those paintings had a big influence on my Disney Hall project. Um, for me, the client is very important. The client brings to the table a set of requirements, a set of uh, problems, which guarantee that I'm not going to repeat myself. It makes the projects different, and I look forward to that and, and need that and, and uh, trust that. And it's that interaction that um, uh, in Bilbao and in other projects that have, have made them very special for me. Uh, when that doesn't exist, it, it's, it doesn't work for me. 
I'm going to show uh, a bunch of slides. I'm going to go very quickly through them, so because this could be a two-hour lecture or a 15-minute slideshow. Um, the main points for me are uh, I, I am most influenced in my work by painting. Painting, since I was a young kid, has been exciting to me. And I've always marveled at the immediacy of painting, that you look at a painting done 200 years ago and it looks like it was just, the brush strokes were just made. And that immediacy is something that I've been striving for in my work. And it, it governs the way I detail buildings, the whole philosophy of detailing buildings, and, and the selection of materials and the shapes and, and, and uh, way I make, make the buildings. So that, uh, and sometimes it's misunderstood because people think it, it's just a souffle that went together quickly. I try very hard to make it look like that. But to, to actually design it is like watching paint dry. It takes, it is intuitive, it is uh, speculative, it's uh, tiptoeing through into the unknown uh, for me. Uh, if I knew what I was going to do before, I wouldn't do it. So it's more exciting to uh, intuitively explore the unknown. And it's scary. It's, it keeps me very wary and very uh, insecure as I work uh, because I don't know where it's going to go. And uh, like you probably relate to this, when I sit down to work before I start working, because it is scary, I go through a whole denial session. I clean the office. I make a lot of phone calls. I do a lot of things to delay the pleasure that I'm going to have. I'm saying this for young students because uh, I know you experience that fear and I think it's a good fear, it's a positive fear and it, it makes it work in the end. Let's go into... Uh, already. <laughs> I brought the slides with American slip covers and but we tried them before and they seemed to work. The first project I'm showing is uh, oops. <laughs> Thirsty. Now have a to do. Okay. Okay. So I, I show this because I did this for a Dutch client. Uh, I worked with um, Nationality Nederland, which is now called ING, I think, um, and with Paul Koch in Prague, and uh, we were very much trying to make a building that fit into this 19th century environment and, and still was not a copy of it and, and became part of the environment. It became known as Ginger and Fred uh, and it was something I, I started myself in my office by, because there's a guy in this uh, office that has a beautiful view of the castle and in order to preserve his view, I pinched this form in, and it started to look like a female figure, and it became terribly misunderstood. And, and, um, but it means when you go into the building, you go under the skirt of ginger, so that's kind of sexy. It worked. I. I didn't want to show Bilbao because Bilbao has shown so much, but this is it. Uh, this is where I was when I started. Uh, there were industrial uses, there's beautiful hills, and this is the building in place, its relationship to the river, to the 19th century city above. The main, one of the main streets comes down here into the entrance 
of the building. This is at a higher level, so we had to make uh, steps and terraces to bring the building, bring the people down to the river level. The, the office is like a tailor shop when I'm working. There are several models of different scales. These are early studies. Uh, and each one of the shapes of the building is made many times and, and documented and, and uh, a continuous pat making of patterns and shapes. Once the program, I, what I've left out here is that the program and the planning has all been done when we get to this stage. So there's, this is not just uh, uh, forms, it's, it's forms related to a very tight program and the shapes are related to the, the functional uses. They grow out of that. The computer, um, which by now is, is quite common, uh, digitizes the shapes. This thing doesn't work anymore. There. So this digitizer takes the shapes into the computer and then the computer can make a model for me so I see what, what I've got in the computer. So it's a visual check. And then the computer also uh, uh, identifies the pieces of steel once the structural system is set and each piece of steel and its, uh, its connectors are detailed to seven decimal points of accuracy. And so all of this steel structure was, with the help of the computer, couldn't be done otherwise, came in 18% under budget with a six contractors bidding and a 1% spread. So the accuracy of the data that you present to the contractor makes the contractor much more secure and we're able to uh, do a lot of things uh, with that kind of precision. And these are just pictures, the relationship of the existing bridge, part of. I became very involved with knitting the building into the city. The titanium took a couple of years to achieve, to uh, just picking titanium uh, was because I, we were going to use stainless steel and the stainless steel mock-ups look very dull and drab in Bilbao over, over a month period, several months. And I wanted something that had a glow to it. I found a piece of titanium in my office. I put it out on, on a pole in LA. It rained by a miracle that day and the piece of titanium looked golden. Uh, I thought, this is incredible. I found out titanium is twice the cost of steel, stainless steel. We couldn't afford it. Um, we then pursued it and found that we could use the titanium half the thickness of stainless steel, so now I was back in the ballpark. Uh, we then uh, put it as an alternate bid, and luckily the Russians uh, put a lot of titanium on the market that month. <laughs> So uh, there was a lot of good things going. Um, and then once we had the bids and we were, could afford it, we then spent a whole year in Pittsburgh where they roll this stuff till we got the sample exactly like the, the, the sample we had because if you just go and order titanium, you could have trouble. It's like making a salad. You put the right amount of oil and acid instead of oil and vinegar on the rollers and eventually it uh, comes up right. But you have to do it many, many times and many, many attempts until it uh, does what we wanted it to. So this is the view down that street on the left. Uh, I don't think this thing is... Architectural photographers do not take pictures with people, so this picture was taken by a movie director friend of mine, 
who happened to be there and put people in it. Uh, this was the entrance ramp going down, and I wanted to have a uh, picture of Frank Lloyd Wright looking disgusted in that entry, but... So you come down a ramp, and there would be Frank Lloyd Wright, but we couldn't pull it off. Uh, inside the atrium is uh, very animated. The client asked for... I started out making something very rectilinear, and uh, the client said, no, no, come on, we want something contentious, uh, more contentious than Frank Lloyd Wright. He asked me specifically to make it twice the height of the Guggenheim in New York. So, um, the design of the galleries was done uh, with endless models. Uh, there are galleries for living artists in, in the program as it was written, and those were to have sh a shape in them so that the artists would be, they would be contentious, the artists would have to work against them. Uh, we made models of everything, and these, uh, the catwalk I included for lighting so that um, performance art would easily be possible in these galleries. The uh, classical galleries, as they were called, were for dead artists, and they were made, uh, we tested the lights, we made a light fixture, this was a mock-up, a lot of work done in developing lighting. And then uh, these are those galleries, they brought a few, they brought one living artist into the dead artist space, I, uh, Cheetah. This floor was very crucial to me. Uh, I wanted a wood floor, I wanted the warmth of the wood, and usually the wood floors are too busy. The, the small patterns, like uh, here, are difficult for the art. And uh, when you bring natural light in, the uh, light reflects uh, a color from the, floor, from the wood floor up on the paintings, which is difficult for contemporary minimalist paintings. So uh, this floor is made in, in, in Spain. We found it in Spain. It's uh, a very... Uh, clean pattern. It still has the warmth of the wood and it doesn't, uh, uh, it isn't toxic to the paintings. The galleries uh, for living artists have had a lot of different shows. Uh, currently there's a Richard Serra show. Uh, Saul LeWitt did some experimental painting and they continue to use the galleries in that way. The industrial section is still existing that will slowly change, uh, but you get a sense of the texture of the building with the texture of the city, and that was important to me, that, that it read as part of the city. And uh, it's hard to experience that unless you go there. This is the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which was uh, uh, pr planned much in advance of Bilbao and a lot of models, a lot of studies, a lot of uh, agony about what was right. Here's a model of the Concertgebouw, I think. Oh, here it is. In the same scale as our project. So we studied uh, uh, a lot of different models, came up with something that the client wanted uh, uh, similar to the Berlin Philharmonie. And so this is, it will now be built finally, but this, this design is 10 years old now. It will be wood, and uh, we designed the organ. Again, uh, it's one of the early sketches. Uh, I was influenced by sailing, sailing boats, I sail, and I was looking at the Van de Velde paintings and uh, those uh, depictions of sailboats. Again, the many models at the same time. I work on several scales of models at the same time so that I don't become enamored with one model as a, I, I'm focusing on the finished building. And this is a way to keep myself thinking of reality by shifting scales.
The building that originally was done in stone, that was the requirement, and uh, we made a mock-up of the stone when we showed it to the contractor. We already had the mock-up, the computer program, the way of cutting it. Uh, th the budget was monitored by the computer. We could only use 5% uh, of the stone could be double curved, which is 10 times the cost of flat stone. And then 50-50 of the remaining stone uh, in flat and, and cylindrical, single curve. So those criteria were used and, and, and followed. And you can get this kind of, of movement out of it. After Bilbao, the client wanted metal. <laughs> this Dusseldorf harbor, the Rhine, uh, a, a speculative office building project, which I broke into three pieces uh, so that the city breathed, so that the people behind still had their view of the uh, of the river. So we made many models and uh, this on the right is the existing construction. The three buildings, one in plaster, one in stainless steel, and one in brick. This proved to be a very good uh, business strategy because it gave uh, power of one big project and yet had separate identity so that uh, smaller tenants could find identity and that gave more options for rental and within, from the models, these two buildings were completely sold out. So. The uh, making of the panels were by uh, precast, was done with the computer. The uh, computer cut foam and used it as a form. So, and then we made a window, a very special window, that is repetitive and that uh, uh, instead of just being a punched hole, it sort of attacks the building, and I worked hard to get this. It gives the feeling that the form of the building is still intact. I'd, it's an interesting uh, solution from that standpoint. That's what I was looking for. And it gives a, an, an additional texture to the building. It's not a very fancy building, as you can see, it's just... Okay, I think we're now in sync. We were out of sync. The, build, the project opens in September. This is in Berlin at uh, Pariser Platz. Uh, Brandenburg Gate, and we won a competition for this, this project. Uh, it's an office building for a bank headquarters. The controls in Berlin are very uh, stringent. Uh, everybody's heard of Dr. Stimann. Um, and he was uh, strong about his conviction of what the problems were. And I found, in the end, very easy to work with because uh, we came up with creative solutions to his uh, requirements and he accepted them. Uh, it had to be, the, this was the largest windows we could have. We had to have a break here and a break somewhere here. And uh, so I made a, a donut inside his uh, offices around an atrium and using a very great engineer, uh, George Schleich from Stuttgart, we were able to create a, a quite a wonderful roof. The back has housing, uh, uh, which looks now will look on 
Peter Eisenman's Holocaust Memorial. I, I may be, I'm not sure they, they're going to be happy after they bought these, but. Uh, and the housing has an atrium uh, that you see on the left. Uh, you can't go in it, but you only go, enter it in a glass elevator as you go up and down. It's a very special kind of space. And uh, the entry level from Pariser Plots is here. Inside, there's a uh, conference center that has a nice shape to it, and underneath it, a theater, and then there's a cafe at below ground here. The offices surround, surround that space. The large uh, uh, conference room has a uh, unique shape. One of the, I, I'm not going to go into the derivation of it. It comes out of some weirdness I'm into. Uh, it will be covered in stainless steel. And, but this, all of this is stainless steel. And so these three elements, the glass, two glass things and this become one piece. This is the way the uh, frames are cut with the computer. The inside will all be wood. And this is it under construction. Uh, all of the, most of the building is rectilinear, so it's not like uh, Bilbao and, and it's nice to have this come after Bilbao because everybody thinks uh, it's always going to be the same. Uh, the nice thing about this is, th is that because it's an interior, we're able to use wood. And the, this is the stainless steel mock-up for the conference room, the way the steel is cut. And I don't have good pictures, but the one on the left kind of gives you a sense of what it's like there. Uh, the con construction will be through sometimes in December. This is in Seattle, Washington, uh, under the Space Needle. So it's a building that has to be seen from above as well. And it started out to be a Jimi Hendrix museum for Paul Allen, the uh, computer, uh, Bill Gates, former partner. It started with the idea of broken guitars, Jimi Hendrix, and, and evolved into these shapes. But uh, Mr. Allen saw the conference room for Berlin and said he wanted a building that came out of that. He asked specifically for that. He said that was swoopy. I'd never heard that term. <laughs> Um, so the, the center here will be a purplish stainless steel uh, uh, for, for the purple uh, haze of Jimi Hendrix. The entry is uh, here. There will be a projection in the small amphitheater. The monorail goes through this. So there's a monorail that goes right through. That's a public monorail that comes right into the building. Uh, the stainless steel gold and silver will stay the color and then in the middle I use painted red steel which will eventually fade and look like an old truck and that's intentional. And so here they're making the steel and here is the purple haze. This is in Cincinnati. It's a molecular biology, and it's uh, 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 another brick playing with brick, because that's the common material in, in, at this university. There are laboratories. I don't have good pictures. It's just beginning to be finished. These are precast panels of brick, and then the end has a nice metal detail, which uh, 
This is in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Ohio is very avant-garde. I'm telling you that they got Eisenman and Graves and, and uh, a lot of architects. Zaha Hadid is doing work there. It's a strange place. Uh, this site is for a business school for Case Western Reserve next to uh, a law school. And we have this corner, and the beginning models are square, rectilinear, the yellow are the classrooms, the organization of an interior street, and some kind of interior space, and trying to break down the scale, because our building is the first building with a program that is, at a, is denser than the rest of the campus. So we're the first building that's going to be out of scale. Uh, the models, many models like this, and then start to uh, create forms related to the seating, the feeling of these classrooms. Um, before we start, we make uh, endless models of what those classrooms have to be. So we understand these, including the furniture, in great detail so that each of the faculty members uh, understands what they're getting and can interact with us. We then have, again, the tailor shop, lots of models, lots of uh, study models. Uh, the first model on the left uh, usually puts our client into cardiac arrest. Um, I truly believe that we should uh, and I do this, we do bring them into the process so they know what I'm thinking, they know how close I'm actually playing to the bone of their program so that there's not a, a, a uh, we don't spend a lot of money on architecture at the expense of program. We work very close to that, to, the, to their requirements. In fact, sometimes clients says, come to me after and say, can't we have more, more of this uh, architecture? Uh, <laughs> Which is interesting. You wouldn't expect that in buildings like this. Um, this is the interior of those classrooms. Are, are two levels, one above the other, and they, it creates a very tight interior urban space because this is a tight budget building. And uh, when we studied, when we took the uh, surface area off of here, there was too much and we had to cut back. And this is actually on the left, the final design with the cafe that opens to the street, the entrance to the building, the dean's office. You can see this, these two bumps relate to those classrooms that you just saw. And the, it's stainless steel with a shingle. The brick, uh, will be also slightly curved. This will be hand laid brick, though it won't be precast. This is a Bard College. Uh, it's a um, small concert hall for 800 seats. It's a teaching university, and it'll have dance studios next to it and a theater. Uh, furniture I did for Noel. We, similar, we make uh, many mock-ups uh, developing the process, developing the, uh, the uh, prototypes. And then recently, <coughs> Noel, a uh, new chair, which I'm advertising here now, <laughs> will come out in October and it's going to be very cheap, so I hope you buy it. Uh, uh, this was done to look like that building I showed you just before, so it started from there. This is in Hereford, Germany. It's a small museum uh, for a, a German Expressionist collection, a modern art collection, and for contemporary, all in a very small building and a furniture museum. So there's furniture, the art, and then the existing block and you can see the plan. There's a big uh, central gallery for uh, changing 
uh, contemporary work, and then the smaller galleries, uh, cafe, and then the furniture. Uh. And we started with the pile of blocks, and then uh, many models of the interior galleries with uh, skylights. Wow. A study models on the right, and then closer to finish model on the left. This will be brick. All of the wood in the model is, is, is representing brick. And the large uh, Kunsthalle gallery in the middle, and the cafe on the left. This is a uh, cafeteria for Condé Nast, the Vogue magazine, Harp, uh, New Yorker, all of those things. And they're all going to get together in this funny cafeteria. And so I had to make many power tables. And it'll be uh, blue titanium. And the glass in the center, uh, this is a model, and here it is really built. There are 70 pieces of glass. They're all cast uh, separately. And uh, it was a tremendous, a lot of research and effort to get the... Wow. So this is it, and here it is on the left, uh, actually being built. It's all being built in, in, in Canegliano, in near Venice, Italy, and it's right now it's on a boat being shipped. Uh, it's being shipped to New York. It was it saved a lot of money building it in uh, Venice. <laughs> Pretty good. We're almost done. Uh, the final project is uh, MIT. Uh, so there's the, at the bottom of the picture is the Charles River. And this is the dome of MIT. And it goes toward Harvard. And this is our site. Uh, I.M. Pei did some of these buildings. And uh, we've been asked to do a building a cluster of buildings for uh, seven different departments uh, Noam Chomsky's philosophy uh, linguistics uh, uh, artificial intelligence those guys make the, the uh, robots they have a robot called cog and you can talk to it and it learns from you and uh, it's becoming very intelligent and very scary uh, and uh, these are all sort of mad scientists with a lot of opinions and, um, and not terribly interested in architecture as a group. <laughs> uh, in fact, very suspicious that I was going to spend money on uh, architecture that would come out of their little offices and things. So it's been a uh, year. Uh, we did something I've never done before. We, we created a website for this project. And all the students and faculty and, and uh, the administration of MIT have access to this website. And every week we load our funny models and ideas on there. And then we sit back and wait for email. <laughs> and the first six months was uh, very insulting. And now uh, there, we've created a, a trust, a wonderful trust between us and them. And now they are, in fact, asking, can't we have more curved metal? <laughs> but the idea was a, a building, creating a courtyard, and that all these different departments come together in this courtyard where there's a cafe and, and uh, so on. My uh, Shrek model, as I call it here, which has the uh, scary uh, study. And this is about what they could afford. Uh, 
playing with the idea of robots and, and uh, so on. These were, and we did, I'm just showing you two or three there, we did 50. Because I didn't know where I was going to go. As it's coming to an end, uh, it looks very robotic. It's starting to look, for, to me, like uh, uh, Leger, I guess, is the closest. Uh, this will be brick, and these are conference rooms, cafes. The head, of, the head of artificial intelligence will have his office in here, and we're hoping to make this piece move uh, sometime, when he, <laughs> maybe when he's happy. And uh, this is the, they're going to have a nursery, school, and so on. And so these are the several model scales. Uh, and you can see it's at a very precarious state. So I'm showing you something that is not quite finished, just to give you an idea of uh, where I go sometimes. And I think that's it. Thank you. Now what do I do? On the couch. <laughs> so what do you think of them apples, John? That's pretty good, Frank. <laughs> what do you think about these? What do you think about these couches? Pretty nice. They should have been Mies van der Rohe chairs. On them. <laughs> yeah. How about bendy birch? <laughs> um, so we've never done this before. Oh, do you want me to sit closer? <laughs> I wonder if anybody's ever done this before. <laughs> follow, follow Frank Gehry on a couch. Um, you like my shrink. Well, <laughs> now last night I had this dream, John. No, yeah, it just, it's, it's my hair. We, we saw your dreams a minute ago. You, wait a minute. We're friends and neighbors uh, in Los Angeles. Frank and I, we, we don't do this usually. <laughs> usually we're having dinner uh, and talking about everything except buildings. I mean, we've had some connections through buildings, through my museum that was Frank helped uh, us and the architect with a bit, and I've had some connection with your building projects. But we've really never done business together, which is kind of nice. It's kind of nice. It preserves the purity of That's why we're still friends. Our relationship. <laughs> but... Um, I'm curious, on behalf of the audience and myself, about what you're hearing these days. When you go around and get talked to by people who want to build things, um, what do they want? They want Bilbao on a budget? Um, yeah. They want... They want, they want an instant Bilbao. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them have no program, really. A lot of them have no infrastructure, really. People from China, Brazil... Uh, closer places, I won't mention names. Uh, and Tom Krenz of the, of the Guggenheim gets these same calls. We compare notes often. 90% uh, of it is not worth doing because, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't show pictures of it, but I had an experience a few years ago with the American Center in Paris where the institution didn't have the the vision or staying power to, to maintain itself. And uh, we built a building. I didn't realize they were counting on this building. And so they didn't have the, the stuff to back it up, and it failed. And you can't just uh, copy. You can't just create air, you know, a kind of thing. It's got to grow out of the people, out of the... the uh, uh, if it's a public project, it's got to get involved with the politics, it's got to get involved with the... And so we, we are selecting projects based on some feeling that there's reality, uh, that there's some understanding of, of... And there's an infrastructure. There's a, if there's a museum, that there is a, a staff and a uh, director and a collection or a program for something. 
Those are practical things um, have to do with realism on the part of the client. Are you also finding some people who want, want to uh, tiptoe into the unknown, that was your phrase, Yeah. Uh, who want to invest in the next thing and don't mind get, looking at the Shrek model and uh, you know, breaking through? Well, most of the people that, come, that we end up working with are usually looking for something. They, they're sophisticated, they have a sense. Uh, like I didn't show it, but I did a little project in Bad Oinhausen for Dr. Ragatti, uh, who is an energy company chief. He's the director of a small energy company. And he used to come visit me, and he would, the first models he saw, he said, wow, wow. <laughs> and then he come back the next time, and he said, can I have wow, wow, wow? <laughs> so, uh, and, and since I'd never really worked with him before, we pushed it, and we actually pushed it too far. We pushed it to a point where neither he couldn't afford it, and technically I couldn't do it. But, uh, and it got precarious, but it was very interesting, because it, it, uh, I think that the process of bringing clients into the, the modeling and so on does get them involved. and, and it's delightful to work with people like that. You think nationality means anything any longer in architecture? I mean, here you are, Southern California artist, architect, hired by the, the capital of the rather strongly separatist Basques huh? uh, to build a building for uh, an American museum to house some pretty macho American art, among other things, um, a statement of modernity on the part of the Basques. Um, we've got Norman Foster having renovated the Reichstag. We've got, you know, Ando in Fort Worth and Zaha Hadid in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Herzog and Dumero in all over the place in London and San Francisco. I mean, what what's happening here? Globalization, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's inevitable, given the, the communication networks we have, that these... I still think it's important to go and immerse yourself in the culture, find out um, what, what, are the, what is the history, what are the yearnings. I spend a lot of time studying the Basque culture, uh, meeting with uh, their president, their leaders, uh, discussing architecture, looking at pictures of, they have a, a, a line of Basque classical architecture that they're very proud of. Uh, and uh, I, I absorbed a lot of that. I think it's crucial. I, a few years ago I did something in Korea which never got built. And I took time, spent a lot of time through the whole country. I, bought 40 or 50 books on their folklore, on their government, on their elite laws, and I immersed myself in that. I think it, you have to get it in your gut to, to play back something that's relevant. Now, I don't know if everybody does that, and sometimes you feel it. You feel the disconnect, and uh, of course, I bring my own language to it, but what makes a difference is, is that inter... inter, inter action with the different cultures. And it, it's not, you can do it all within the time frame of a normal building project. It's not, it's not like uh, it's going to delay a project 10 years while you get to know the place. You can, you know, you can spend time and, and as you're working. The, the word delay uh sends me to a topic that's an old <laughs> one for you, which is the, the, the sort of reputation as enfant terrible, which is, of course, getting more and more silly since you're neither enfant nor were you, or are you, have you been terrible, but uh, there is, uh, the, what people forget is that Gary really has been for quite a long time, um, before he began to make the newspapers, a developer's architect, an architect who had to build buildings that came in on time and on budget, and quite a lot of them, and you did, and you got to hear something of the program considerations and the budget crunches that you go through. But this is interesting for you. I mean, I know you take pride in 
that aspect of your work I do, every yeah. bit as much as the, art, as the artistic side. It might be worth saying something to younger architects about this. Well, I think it's, you're not going to build stuff unless, I mean, you can't break your clients unless you're the Getty. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> They're unbreakable. Um, I think that, that most clients have budgets and most clients want to build more than they can afford. And uh, a lot of times architects are misled by the client's uh, joy and working with uh, that they're going to uh, be able to reach and spend more money. And that's always wishful thinking because I think it's much better to, to dig into the reality quickly. Uh, building costs are not finite. You can't control them. I mean, the markets go up and down uh, enormously. The, there's a big, terrible bust right now in the construction industry, probably all over the world because of the millennium fever. Everybody wants to finish everything by the millennium. Uh, I think next year it's going to go down again and to reality. But uh, so it's important to develop techniques of, of assessing where you're going. And we work very detailed with the subcontractors who are going to actually build the thing. So, uh, and we have some people we work with a lot, like uh, Permis di Lisa in Italy that's building the cafeteria, actually built ginger for Paul Koch. And he had a great relationship with, with uh, Permis di Lisa. Uh, and Permis di Lisa made the skin for Bilbao. And uh, there's a firm in Kansas City that does uh, metal skins who did uh, the building in, in Minneapolis, the uh, small museum I did there. And we were able to get a price from them that they held to through the construction. It was real important. So you get real very, very early. And, and uh, you know, it's still not perfect. You're not going to guarantee it. But it does at least keep you in the ballpark. And you have choices to make. And, and you give the client those kind of choices and, uh, and follow the client's priorities. Because uh, the client really wants a successful building. So the architect, you know, you can follow all their priorities and make something that isn't going to be much. Uh, so they don't want that. They come to you for something special. And uh, the cost of the something special is, I think any architect uh, spends about the same amount, you know, on the way they detail it. Uh, certain people do, uh, do their detailing differently. They spend their money there. I make this funny shapes. I put the money there. It's the same money. <laughs> I want to ask you a question about collaboration. I uh, had a funny experience the other day. I drove to the Los Angeles airport from home and passed your building that you did for the Chiat Day off an of advertising firm, a building in which you collaborated with, uh, with Klaus Oldenburg and Koshi van Brugge, and you um, arranged an entrance to those buildings uh, through pylons, pylons formed by a massive blown up sculpture of a pair of binoculars. It's a kind of wonderful conceit. There's Oldenburg framed by two wings by, by Gary. And the next day I went to the Pariser Platz building and went in, in the lobby and saw the collaboration of the right side of Gary's brain with the left side, um, <laughs> a collaboration with yourself, uh, the sculptor self and the architect self. Which way are we going here? Are you going to go back to artists? You're going to stick? You're going to be the artist yourself? <laughs> you're looking for artists? You said you were looking for other architects. Yeah. Well, I, uh, my first experiments in collaboration definitely started with the artists because the artists um, uh, were very willing, especially when I gave Klaus and Kosher the frontispiece. They were very excited that uh, they had the front of the building. For me, that was a test of my own. Uh, ego. Could I, st could I stand it? <laughs> uh, could I uh, 
stand having the, pi the picture of the building be the binoculars and leaving my part out, which happened. Charlie Jenks, one of my best friends, made two books with binoculars, with left leaving my stuff out. So my prophecy came true. Um, but I think of it as the binocular building, and, and it was a funny collaboration because I insisted that Klaus and Co. should be, act like architects, that this be a building, that it had to have windows in it. And uh, uh, so they put windows in it. You don't see them. They're little slots. They hit them in the back. Uh, and I let them buy on it. But uh, somebody's coming. The, um, Thanks. the collaboration with architects and, uh, first of all, I think that uh, the, the modern city is, is a product of democracy and democracy is pluralist, pluralist uh, and is a collision of ideas and in the city it's very much a collision and a chaos. And I don't think we have really dealt with it aesthetically. We've sort of, uh, in many cases, tried to go back to the 19th century because that model's easier and, uh, and safer. And so I think that one way is that people, these collision of ideas happen in some kind of concert that you, and I've done this with David Childs in New York with two high-rise buildings. They weren't built where we played off each other on a, on a uh, simultaneous basis. I would come in with my model, he would come in with his, and then we'd start to shift the buildings, move them so that we started to compose the forms even though he was doing something that was very postmodern at the time, it was during that period and I was doing something very fish-like and abstract. And these two uh, shapes, I thought it, it was getting very, very interesting, this play, and neither one had to subordinate to the other. And the richness of it excited me. I've done it again with him in, uh, in Mexico City with Legareta. Again, the project didn't, didn't happen, but the, the richness of the experience of playing off each other entices me to go forward. I had a project in Dusseldorf, uh, not the one I showed, but um, a new one, and uh, I brought Rem Kohlhaus and uh, Jean Nouvel in. And we did, I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't show that. We started to play off each other in the same way and it was very exciting and I think the product of it uh, interested me. So it's a way of building the city in parts, uh, reflecting this pluralism, and uh, I think it's a way to do it. Now, there is a movement now to go back to the megalomanic projects where one architect does everything. I don't feel comfortable with that anymore. Uh, I think it's wrong. I think it's uh, not reflective of of our political system, the way we think, the way people feel. Now, my way may lose some of the big moves, and that's, I, I think we have to, uh, you know, the big park or the big uh, public space or the, uh, we have to learn to, to factor those things in as we work together. But I'd rather do it that way than, than unilaterally, mm -hmm. I think. You haven't mentioned me landscape architects, but you've been a great success in integrating landscape designs into the whole concept of a building project. You know, landscape architecture is harder. It's, uh, the whole profession of landscape architects has, has, been, has grown up as handmaidens to architects. And, uh, and then the, the few people who have come out of the woodwork who are, are our rugged individualist artists uh, making landscapes like uh, Martha Schwartz and, and others like that, uh, I haven't been able to 
I haven't found one of those that I, I've been able to work with yet, but um, I think it's a profession that needs some help, and I think it's crucial. <laughs> um, but I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Mm. Um, let's talk about museums for a second, and then I think we'll ask for questions from the audience. Um, a lot of discussion in museum, among museum people and among critic, architectural critics um, about a kind of built-in pull between museums as popular entertainment, um, exciting attractions uh, that uh, reward behaviors we associate or have previously associated largely with other kinds of places, uh, shopping malls, um, entertainment centers, and um, towards the focused and kind of contemplative and receptive state of mind that we hope for out of respect for artists and their work. It's a very tough pull, and you've managed, I think in Bilbao anyway, uh, to conquer the problem awfully well. You've had a recent adventure renovating a not very good building of the 60s in Pasadena. You want to talk about it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> How's that for a shrink question? <laughs> you want to talk about it. How did it feel? Um, years ago, I did a house for Norton Simon, and, and he was a tough hombre to work for. Um, he, he died. He left the Pasadena Museum. He left the Norton Simon Museum to his widow, Jennifer Jones Simon, who's an actress you've all seen and know. And she's not a museum person and is trying to um, uh, enhance the collection. There were problems with the existing building. I, uh, I was on the board of trustees of the Simon Museum by her choice. And so I ended up, it was like pulling the string on a sweater, you know, the, I just started pulling it a little, <laughs> and I ended up unraveling the whole sweater and uh, getting myself in deeper than I should have. But in order to do it, since it was it's essentially a 19th century collection, and it's not my area of expertise by a long shot, and so I called on various people to walk through the museum with me, uh, one of them being Mr. Walsh the main person I, I listened to. And I said, uh, tell me what, you know, if I had a very limited budget, what are the priorities? What can I do to this building? What should I do? And he gave me a sort of a Ten Commandments that were interesting. I then uh, cajoled Wolf Dieter Duba from Berlin to do the same. And he gave me his list. And uh, Jennifer had Carter Brown come through. I couldn't attend that day, but essentially the list was similar. And uh, we had Seymour Sly from the Fog, and uh, Irving Laven from Princeton. I don't know, at least eight or ten experts. This is a very West Coast process, by the way. Yeah. This, this is something that happens very commonly in California. And, kind of and I, I listened to all of them and then started, I made a mock-up of, uh, of three or four of the galleries and followed this carefully and it's all been remodeled. It's not ar architecture, it's not like uh, Bilbao or anything, it's, um, it, the whole thing was done for under five million dollars uh, and it opens in October again, it never really closed. Uh, we did it five galleries at a time, but it, uh, I think it's fairly su fairly successful. Yeah, I think it's more than fairly successful. Yeah. I think it's very successful, but I'm, I'm cu curious about what this said to you. I mean, do you want to do a museum for older art? Sure. And, and what, what would you... You know, for me, the, you the, uh, well, now we've uh, won this competition in Washington for the Corcoran Gallery, and the director is a very different uh, person than Tom Kranz. He has a whole different philosophy. Uh, this new director 
doesn't like much of the art that I think is great. Uh, and I'm all excited about it because it's a different point of view. And, and you know, the thing about museums and, and how to show art is beauty's in the eye of the beholder. There's so many issues. It's like doing a concert hall. Uh, you nev you're never going to get it right in, in any one place. It's so elusive, so, uh, you know, impossible. Uh, just about the time you design it for one kind of art, the, the whole art movement changes and something else comes comes along and make uh, bigger and better and whatever. There's performance art now. There's uh, video art. Uh, you couldn't have predicted that. Uh, but the issues of, of the entertainment thing are, are, are interesting because um, the museums, in order to survive, the, the public uh, like uh, the Louvre, like uh, Berlin, uh, Museum Island, they have to get a certain number of people through the museum, through a bookstore, through a coffee shop. They need that attendance in order to, to uh, for these institutions to survive. And so they're, and people are being driven to entertainment. So if you go to Pays uh, Louvre with the pyramid uh, on any given day, uh, you're liable to run into kids running through the galleries uh, I almost feel like someday I'm going to see skateboards in the galleries. Uh, there's a shopping center. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a populist place. It's everything I've always felt that uh, wouldn't it be nice if all of the people in the world could mm -hmm. want to go to a museum. And, and so here it is. They did it. I.M. Pei did it. It's in the Louvre. It's one of the major institutions of the world. And it's I, I'm scared to go there. I've never, I mean, I walk through. I, luckily, uh, some of the paintings I like, the, most of the people don't want to see, so I, they, you can go see them. But uh, the lineups for the, for the uh, Mona Lisa, the, uh, they're 10 deep. And, and so it is a populist thing. It is the, of the times. It is necessary. Uh, Berlin. I was in that competition, which we lost in the end, but uh, where the museum directors wanted to do something like that. They wanted to, to create a place that would have the two-hour tourist uh, trip through it and then have the, uh, another way to see the museum if you were a scholar and you could spend time, and that these two would not conflict. Uh, a lot of people in Berlin took umbrage with that. They didn't mm. like that idea. They were afraid of it becoming the Louvre. Uh, and, and they're resisting that kind of thing. What is right, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, the times dictated. It's not an architect's um, I mean, alone to dictate that. What, for me, the, the contemporary, the, my contemporaries, I've listened to them for years talk about the terrible neutral box museums that they hate. And most architects, most architects, including myself for a long time, when asked about doing a museum would always say, well, of course you make a, a space that defers to the art. And I used to say that, and I used to get my head chopped off by some great artists who would say, What's the matter? You got no ideas? <laughs> can't have a? Can't you take us on? We want to be in an important place. If you're going to build, if I'm going to put my art somewhere, I want it to be somewhere that is important. So I want to. When I tell my mother I'm in this building, I want her to say, "Oh, that's a great place to have your art." Uh, and this is human nature. And and uh, as as. Uh, formalistic and whatever you want to say about Bilbao, I've had a great uh, uh, outpouring of support from the artists uh, about this design because in Bilbao you had to make a building that was as important as the courthouse and the uh, city hall and the library in order for it to have a, a presence in the city for people to take it seriously and then establish it as a, a place that people want to go to, and then 
make galleries that the art can be seen in comfortably. Now, a lot of galleries are made with fussy details. I mean, the great Louis Kahn made a, one of the great buildings of our century at the Kimball Museum. And he detailed the death out of those galleries. And they are toxic to contemporary art. You couldn't show contemporary art there. Now, it's, I think it's toxic to, to the paintings that are there. Uh, but it's a beautiful building, and it shows how this, this architectural fussy detailing uh, and isn't appropriate in, in these museums. And I've just recently been to a friend's show in a very beautiful, white, neutral, uh, all the essence of what architects say they, that a gallery should be, and that is very toxic. It made this poor guy's art look like doo-doo. It really destroyed it. So finally you say, well, art is shown in a context, you know. Years ago I went to the Kunsthistorisch and I saw the four Bruegel paintings in the classical galleries with fabric on the walls, the skylight, the wood floors, and I, it dropped me to my knees. I was so powerful seeing those four Bruegels. I went back three years later to see the same three, four Bruegels and they were temporarily in a small room mm. uh, that, while the main building was being remodeled. And those Bruegels, it took me an hour to get back into the paintings because they were diminished by the, by the, by the context. So art is, showing art is a contextual thing. You have to think of it that way. And you, I believe, have to enhance the experience of the viewer. You have to take them into account. One of the reasons to have natural light is because it feels better to the viewer. It may be, in some cases, toxic to the art, and you have to mitigate it, but having this relief, having the ability to have a window to the outside occasionally, uh, makes the viewing experience, the context, better. And I think John worked on that very hard at the Getty. Um, Let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. If you'll hold up your hand, um, somebody with a microphone will come over to you. They'll wave that dangerous looking thing at you. Put it near your mouth. I thought John and I were going to talk about museums, so I well, came all could. prepared maybe, to talk. Maybe we'll get some museum <laughs> questions. Put your hand up, please, if you're going to ask a question. All right. Here, please. Just, just here, here it comes. How much do you understand about computers? Obviously, you use it, you own, use it to the maximum, but are you able to get into the computer, turn it on? How much do you understand about you, that? You just got to the... <laughs> to, yeah. uh, that hurts. <laughs> I do not even know how to do the VCR at home. The, uh, I have a computer on my desk that I talk to, that it prints what I say, and it won't take swear words. I've tried it. it um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a fraud. <laughs> yeah. There's a guy back there. Oh, yeah? Down front? No, way back there. Oh, okay. First then, then then. Way in the back. Okay. Uh, hello. I got a question about the Getty Center. I don't know anything about the start of it, but I was just curious, uh, why did, didn't Frank Gehry get a commission for the Getty Center oh, in Los yeah. Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you have to turn the clock back to 1980, 1983. Um, that explains a lot. Um, this was a very, very large commission on a virgin piece of land. Uh, that the Getty, we, uh, felt really required the work of what was already um, a large office with large capacity. Um, it's a project that involved a huge task of engineering, uh, supplies of services, and many, many other things. It was not, in other words, solely a question of architectural conservatism, although I will admit that there was a bit of that too. Um, 
the finalists um, in the competition included uh, James Sterling uh, and Fumihiko Maki. So it, it wasn't entirely a, a conservative list. Uh, but I think both the size and complexity of the project and the relative size and, at that time, experience of the Gary office, however much we liked Frank and had hugely admired the buildings he had built so far, the feeling was that there wasn't yet a match uh, for the Gary office and this project. I also concurred at the time. I mean, I, I didn't really uh, struggle to go after the job and, uh, and, and try to convince them. I thought it was early for me and it was, I was just, uh, I'm a late bloomer, so I, I, it's true. I mean, I started, I, the real, pro I'm 70 now, the real projects uh, have yeah. only started when I was 60, and, and that was after, yeah. after this period. At that time, I'd done a library in Hollywood and very, very small projects, and I think had they picked me, it would have killed me. It would, it would have been a disaster for me and them. Yeah, you, you did a lot of good for the project. I have to say, uh, Frank was an advisor to us during the project, an advisor to Richard Meyer, and uh, there came some moments when Frank's help was very important. Um, a stage, for example, when the project had been designed to, I think a, you would have to say, a stage of unnecessary complexity. Um, a project that looked to be possibly f fussy, over-elaborate, and so forth. And, we couldn't really say that to him. I mean, we could say it, but we couldn't be listened to with the same respect that Frank could. He, as a friend of Richard's and a, a completely dégagé, uh, was able to give Frank, uh, give, uh, give uh, Richard Meyer uh, courage, I think, to follow his own best instincts at a moment when that really counted for a lot. I was able to also talk to board members and, yeah. and uh, convince them to give him a little more freedom because there was a tendency to, to make Richard Meyer not Richard Meyer for a while, and, and uh, we got over that. There's a question way in the back. And you, sir, you had your hand up, and then there was one down front here somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so why don't microphone number two come over here? Oh, Hello. There, here she this is. This is a question. This is something completely different. This is something about your early work and your fascination for fish forms and the sculptures you developed. Uh, can you please throw some light on and tell us something about your development from there on and experimentation on fish forms? Fish forms. That, fish, weir that, weird, stuff, that weird stuff you're into. <laughs> uh, well, there are all kinds of uh, sort of, what do you call them? Uh, background uh, things like I'm a Pisces and uh, like swimming and sailing and and my grandmother had fish in the bathtub and there's all kinds of <laughs> folklore and before she made gefilte fish before she made gefilte fish and when i was a kid i was uh beaten up in canada by for killing christ and i was called fish head for some reason that was an anti-semitic comment for some reason at that time uh i think none of that has any Real relevant. I was, I was interested in um, the issue of movement, the that inert materials could uh, have a feeling, have a feeling in them, and uh, you see it in sculpture. You see it in the Elgin marbles. Uh, uh, you see it a lot in the Indian sculptures, the dancing figures, the Shiva. Um, you see it in some contemporary uh, sculpture, mo mostly in antiquity. Uh, uh, the charioteer in Delphi, the feeling of the folds, the feeling that it, it's fluttering in the wind. Um, and I was looking for something to replace decoration because uh, I'm a modernist. I was, grew up with the Los uh, Edict that decoration is sin. Whether that's true or not doesn't matter. That's how I was formed. Um, so I was looking for something to create a feeling and to also this immediacy. When my friends started making what was called postmodernism, 
and looking backwards, uh, I, I reacted to it uh, because postmodernism came uh, is anthropomorphic. And I said, if you're going to go back again to the past, why don't you go back further? Fish were on Earth 300 million years before man. Uh, and I just, it was just an uh, expression of anger. It was just, and then I started to, to draw fish as this expression of anger. And uh, I would, uh, then I started looking at Hiroshige's uh, uh, fish drawings and looking at the carp and realized that these very subtle movements of the carp uh, were very architectural. And I made uh, some shapes that were fish-like. And the early ones were very much kitsch. They were very, uh, one of the first ones was in Turin. I was with uh, Rudy Fuchs today and reminded him. Uh, I made a wooden fish, 35 feet long, for a, a fashion show. And they gave it to the Torino Museum for a show. And it was sitting in this gallery. And it was embarrassing, actually, to be next to it. But Rudy and I were standing there, and it did work. It felt like, like this flick of the tail somehow. And uh, he remarked it and took me to coffee to talk about this movement uh, and w what was I trying to do. And, and uh, then I started making, taking that language into uh, room size forms without where I cut off the tail and cut off the head and cut off the fins and started to get it abstract and to see how far I could go, how, how abstract I could get it and still have the movement. It was, it was a way of learning a language of movement uh, that derived from by intuition, not any other, anything else from this, the fish form. So, uh, but I learned to build those, those shapes and that led me to the computer and a lot of people from the aircraft industry that helped me do that. And uh, so it's true that the language does come from all of that, but it's not a mysterious, uh, uh, I don't incant and, and have <laughs> ceremonies about fish. <laughs> <laughs> Is do you like Tron Chamberlain? And two, yes. uh, do you have something against a straight line? <laughs> uh, John Chamberlain happens to be a personal friend uh, for years, uh, uh, and I really believe that that uh, my work is comes out of painting and sculpture. It's uh, all of the influences I've, I've ever... Berlin is all straight. I don't, I like doing straight buildings. Maybe now I'll do only straight buildings, who knows. Um, I had to go, th it's just you follow your intuitions through a process, through a time, through a exploration. And uh, it, it s starts to work. And then, like everything else, you cut back. You go through a, a Baroque period, and then you come back to a more minimal uh, expression of it, trying to get, achieve. You only know how to get it into a square rectilinear building after you've explored how to get that feeling. I, I didn't know how to do it. And now I'm starting to understand that it takes very little um, movement to achieve this this feeling, and and uh, so I I think it'll just cyclical. I mean, uh, I might do it all at the same time, like in Berlin, where I did a little of each. This woman wanted. When. I 
want to put a question to you. I recently visited uh, Bilbao and was lucky to see the uh, exhibition of Sarah in the beautiful oblong space. And I also noticed the centerpiece of uh, the sculpture by Sarah. Was it inspired by the space or did Sarah sculpture inspire your building? Uh, it's uh, the sculpture it's, which always permanent there. It, I know. It's, I haven't seen the, the installation. I'm going there next week. Um, the, uh, the truth is that Richard, Sarah, and I have been talking to each other through our work for, oh, 25 years. Uh, we talk on the phone a lot. We compare notes. We, he, all of those new pieces were developed with our aircraft guys and the computer. He wasn't able to make them without that technology, and we put them together with the, those people. Uh, I think we've influenced each other. I, he says that, and I say it, so <laughs> I, it must be true. <laughs> we're, gonna stop. we're finished. We are, I think, uh, all receiving strong hints from the organizer of this evening that we are running out of time. Mrs. Wertheim is not a lady that you can ignore. So I would suggest that this is perhaps an appropriate point to wind up the official part of this evening. And perhaps I can just say a few words of thanks on behalf of all of you and also on behalf of ING, who has been very pleased to sponsor this event. First of all, I guess a word of thanks to the John Adams Institute and to Anna Wertheim in particular. This has been, uh, I think, a truly daring American adventure in architecture. It's not the only one that's going on in Amsterdam right now. There are many more to follow, but I think we all agree that this has been a very memorable event in many ways, of many senses of the word. Mr. Gary, I think we uh, have been all delighted to have you with us tonight as a guest, and we are grateful to you for your willingness to share your views with us, also to present a view of yourself as an artist at work. I think it's been clear throughout that you would rather be an artist at work than somebody talking about an artist at work. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think you have given us a presentation that was uh, revealing, very funny occasionally, very entertaining, and basically a very good way to get acquainted or reacquainted with all that you have done. And I think we've all come to realize throughout the evening that your work reaches, I think, beyond many of the traditional limits of architecture that we have come to recognize, up to and including, of course, your wonderful museum in Bilbao, I think having looked at it again, it must be one of the few buildings which, even if you look at it on a picture, evokes an immediate emotional response, a kind of search of happiness that we live in a world where this kind of, of visual poetry gets created. And I'm sure that your new building, the Disney Museum, will add another sensation that is very, very similar. Your work, I'm sure, will continue to intrigue all of us. It will continue to provoke and to challenge, and I'm sure also to delight. And it is only fair to recall that, with good reason, your work has been categorized as being among the more adventurous and brilliant pieces of architecture of our time, defying convention and defying classification. The Pritzker jury, when one of your many prizes were awarded, called you a mature adventure and a cool romantic. <laughs> I'm not sure that your wife agrees but I'm sure that your professional colleagues recognize it for what it is, a very apt description. You, uh, you have always been extremely concerned about spaces, about the way people move and live in the spaces that you create. You've also, I think, emphasized again and again that material is extremely important to you. Tonight you have talked on several occasions about the way in which you explore the limits of that material using a computer in your own fashion, I understand. Uh, also exploring the limits of your budget in the process, something I'm sure many of us recognize as well. And altogether, uh, when one has to summarize your philosophy, I think one of your most remarkable quotations is that every building is in its very nature a sculpture. Thinking about that sculpture, of course, reminds me in particular of the building that you created for us in Prague, the Nationale Nederlander building, which is so many things to so many people, a crushed Coca-Cola can to some, a memorial of urban destruction uh, to others, but I think to many of us at the very least a new jewel in the crown of the architecture of that city, and in particular so to the owners that I am uh, very pleased and proud to represent here. 
We are very, very proud of that landmark building. I think we are equally proud to be associated with you again in Prague in the regeneration of an old uh, beer brewery in the surrounding grounds. I think proud to be given the opportunity as a financial group to have you once again contribute to the urban landscape in a very important part of the world. And I'm sure it will be extremely successful once again. So thanks to many people here. Thanks to Case Dam for introducing the speaker. Thanks to the John Adam Institute. Thanks to John Walsh for guiding us through the discussion. Thanks to all of you for contributing. But I think first and foremost, thanks to you, Mr. Gary. You are a remarkable human being, a late bloomer at 70, <laughs> but definitely a bloomer. And I'm sure you remember with all of us that Frank Lloyd Wright went up to do a lot of useful work until he was 92. Thank you for this evening. It was a, a swoopy evening.